Hi, everybody. Welcome back oh, yeah. um, to our last session number five. Um, we're going to start, as we always do, um, just with the soothing rhythm breathing. Um, I hope everyone's okay and that you've not had too stressful a day at work if you've been at work. Um, so just, as always, getting into a comfortable, upright posture. Both feet flat on the floor in front of you. And just imagine that there's a string holding your head up to the ceiling. So your back is upright, but in its natural S shape. And if you're comfortable closing your eyes, or if not, just letting your gaze soften slowly, softly in front of you. And just thinking of greeting a loved one Maybe it's a, a person, maybe it's an animal, but just imagine seeing them in front of you and being really pleased to see them. So just adjusting your facial expressions accordingly, maybe settling your face into a half smile. And just start to pay attention to your breath. So you might notice your breath your chest rising and falling or maybe the feeling of the air coming in and out of your nostrils perhaps noticing the cold air going in and the warm air going out maybe putting a hand on your abdomen and seeing if you notice your breath there your stomach just going in and out slightly as you fill your lungs. Maybe you can see if you notice your breath in the back of your body. Perhaps your rib cage expanding and contracting. And you find that your mind will get distracted because that's what minds do, our tricky brains. When that happens, just Gently and kindly, bringing it back to focus on your breath. And then just see if you can, just start to slow your breath down slightly. Perhaps taking a deeper breath than you normally do. And just holding it a little bit at the top of your in-breath. And then a gentle, long, slow breath out. And if it helps on your out breath, just saying the words in your mind, mind slowing down. And again, on your out breath, body slowing down down. Maybe just starting to feel a bit more grounded in your seat. Perhaps your feet feel a bit heavier on the floor. You're just relaxing back a little bit into your seat. Getting your mind online and ready for the session. And then when you're ready, just opening your eyes, ending the exercise in your own time, bringing your attention back to the room and hopefully bringing this feeling of being slowed down into the rest of the session. Do you want me to share the slides, Lee? Yeah, if you would. Yeah. <clears throat> right, hopefully you can see that. Yeah. 
Yep. So, hello everybody. Uh, welcome to the fifth and last session. So, just looking here um, about what we're going to do. This is what we're doing. Going to go through this week. Um, we're going to look at what we've done so far. Then we're going to look a little bit at um, compassionate reasoning. Then how we actually put our com compassionate self to work. And other flows of compassion. Do you want the next yeah. slide? Yeah. yeah. Ooh. It doesn't seem to be working. There we go. <clears throat> so, yeah. So just looking at why, why compassion? <clears throat> so why compassion? Because it helps us take responsibility for our minds, because it's a courageous motivation to engage with other people. Um, there's, a, there's a story of two, of two wolves from um, North American folklore. Uh, and the, uh, there's a grandfather walking his uh, grandson and uh, talking to him about um, the internal battle that's inside all of us. Uh, and he says to his grandson, there are, there are two wolves inside all of us. One's vengeful, angry, resentful, self-pitying and scared. And the other wolf is compassionate, faithful, hopeful, caring. And the grandson asks him, which wolf's going to win, grandfather? And the grandfather says, the one that you feed. So what we're looking at is what compassion is and how do we feed it? How do we encourage it? So we've looked at the definition of compassion and the definition that, that we use is a sensitivity to suffering in self and others with a commitment to alleviate and prevent it. And we've looked at the, the two psychologies, we're gonna go over that again today, about the first bit of the sensitivity to suffering, and then the second about our commitment to do something about it. So the third one, we all just find ourselves here. We didn't choose to be born, we didn't choose to be born into the family we found ourselves in, and so much of what happens to us is not our fault. Fourth one, we're shaped by evolution, social circumstance, most of which we have very little control over. So we're all part of the flow of life. We're a product of millions of years of evolution. That's just who we are. And the next point ties into that. We have tricky brains. The old brain plus the new brain gives us a, a very tricky brain. It's a bit of a simplification. Uh, we've, look, we've looked a bit more in depth at, at what this means, but it's useful to think of us sometimes as uh, having an old brain and a new brain. And it's a simple model that people can understand. And, and we told you the story of the zebra and the lion and how the old brain and the new brain connect together in us. We have a highly developed new brain as well as this old brain that often takes over. And that causes us all sorts of suffering, causes us to ruminate and catastrophize. We looked at the three circles and how uh, the three emotional regulation systems and how we need them all in balance. And we looked a bit about how we as humans have an inbuilt negativity bias to keep us safe. So if we're walking in the woods late at night and we hear a noise, we don't assume it's somebody's lost little dog. We go, what's that? <clears throat> and, and go, disappear, run. Our fight, flight, our threat system is, is brought online. So using the body to calm the mind, we've looked a little bit at that. Uh, we've looked at soothing rhythm breathing. We looked at body scan. We've looked at various ways in which we can help ourselves get into the, as stimulate the parasympathetic nervous system. We looked at how we can 
use notice and return. So we sit and we breathe. We notice that we're distracted. Our tricky brain takes us off all over the place. That's okay. That's what we have to deal with. And we begin to learn that we can do something about our attention. We can notice that we're distracted and we can laugh at the fact that we've got a tricky brain and we can gently encourage our attention to settle back onto our breath. In that way, we make the body, we make us, make our mind a, a safe haven, a, a secure base. And you can see how this, we've talked a little bit, how this attach, um, connects to attachment theory, how we are looking to provide our own safe base, our own place that we can go when our anxiety goes up. So just like our primary carer would when we were a child, if we were lucky, would see us, see our threat system rise, and it would help soothe that and allow us to go back out and explore. And the last one, mindfulness is key. A mind that doesn't know itself can be dangerous. So we've looked at that. Um, we, we acknowledge that much of what happens to us isn't our fault. That's fair enough. So where does our responsibility lie? Well, we'll talk about that more again today. Or well, it lies in understanding that we have a tricky brain and that we can be skillful and we can do more helpful things to make us safe and to be compassionate for ourselves, for other people and in the world. And that's a win-win situation as far as I can see. Yeah. And I think the, the only thing I'd add is, is just coming back to the, the using the body to calm the mind, just remembering that when we are in states of high emotion, particularly kind of threat-based emotions, anger, anxiety, disgust, our frontal lobes that, that is almost our new brain that kind of helps helps us think things through and plan and reason and um, soothe ourselves, that goes offline, um, you know, for good reason, because the, the body's kind of in a threat zone. So, so calming our body helps to bring our frontal lobes back online and, and help us reason and, and think things through a little bit better. So that's why we always start with calming our bodies. We don't always have to be in our soothing system in order to be um, compassionate. You know, sometimes we need a little anger in our lives to make us stand up for ourselves or make us stand up for the rights of other people. Or if you imagine a, um, a, a caregiver defending their child, um, which is a very compassionate action, it may well come from the threat system. So um, it's important not to, <coughs> not to conflate the, the soothing system with compassion, but to know that our soothing system can be really helpful for us and it makes it much easier to sort of, and, and that often sets the conditions for compassion when we're training compassion in our minds. So the other things that we covered, um, as Lee said, we've covered the the different types of emotions, so our threat systems, the anger, anxiety, disgust, the, the emotions that are all focused on trying to keep us safe, getting us away from danger, making us fight danger if we need it. Um, and then we've talked about our drive system, those emotions associated with get up and go. So um, the, the dopamine, the brain's reward system, um, it's all about achieving resources and, um, and making us kind of get out there in life. And then our soothing system, which we've focused on a lot, those calmer, feeling connected. Um, and I, I think Lee said at some point that the most, the, the soothing system is often about a, affiliation and feeling connected and having that relationship. And, and the most important relationship that we have is, is the one that we have with ourselves. So, and we've talked about the, the different flows of compassion. Um, so compassion that we have to ourselves, um, compassion that we, we might direct to others and um, also receiving compassion from others. But we've really focused um, in the last four sessions on compassion to ourselves because kind of because we figured that, um, you know, we're going to, this course is attended by um, people that are working in healthcare and often people working in healthcare have, have got quite a well-developed compassion to others, although things can certainly get in the way for it, of it for us and um, certain systems often um, struggle. But 
we perhaps find it a bit harder to be compassionate to ourselves at times. So, so it's been a purposeful neglect of the other flows, but we are going to touch on those today because really um, the compassion to be helpful to us, we do need all of the three different flows. Um, and then we've looked at barriers to compassion. So we talked about fears that we might have of it, um, you know, if it's not something that we've been used to, um, or perhaps if we've had experiences in our early lives where compassion has then been followed or the connection with other human beings has, has then been followed by abuse, then um, we might be much more fearful of it. Um, so that's that's the fears. Um, We've also, there's the blocks that we might have to compassion. So when we really want to develop it, but um, certain things might get in the way, maybe not sure, sure how. And then resistances that we can have to compassion. So perhaps some of the things, a, a sense that, you know, it might mean that I'm weak. It might mean that I'm letting people off the hook. Um, so trying to kind of identify those in ourselves. Um, and then we've, as I said, we've really focused on developing compassion to ourselves. So um, really focusing on the, the kind of meditations and things of, of wishing ourselves well, of thinking about the kind of core qualities that we might need to do that. And particularly we, we went through the, um, talked about the two schools example where um, you could send your child to um, a school where people whenever they made mistakes, it was pointed out and people came down on them like a ton of bricks and didn't let them forget it and kept going over and over what they'd done wrong and, and beat them up for it. Or the school where mistakes are noticed, but understood and, and reasoned and, um, you know, pointed out, but um, in, a, in a kind of caring way and understanding the, the, the underlying cause of it and then encouragement and reassurance about the future and deciding which I think most people know which school they would want um, their, their child or loved one to go to. So um, we've got this intuitive wisdom in us. Um, and then we looked at a functional analysis of our self-critic. So trying to kind of imagine our self-critic in front of them, what they would look like. Um, what they would sound like and what their intention and, and wishes and fears were to, to try and kind of understand it more and perhaps have some compassion towards it um, but and then comparing that with um, our newly developed or hopefully built upon compassionate self and, and comparing the, the compassionate self's wishes and trying to point out this this difference between um, kind of beating ourselves up for things or having compassion focused self-correction you know it's it's fine to have a wish to want things to be different and our behavior to be different but it's about the way that we do that um with ourselves and um in the way that's most helpful to ourselves and then we talked um as lee mentioned about the two psychologies of compassion these the sort of attributes that um that we might need to develop in order to turn towards suffering which i'm going to go back through again in a minute and, and the skills and the particular skills that we focused on are attention and imagery. So this is a, a summary from um, CFT. Um, I can't think which actual book this is from. I think it's um, reproduced from um, The Compassionate Mind originally um, by Paul Gilbert. But this summarises the, the, the different skills and attributes that we need. So the inner circle, the attributes, these are qualities that we can develop on um, to help us turn towards suffering. Um, so we need that sensitivity, we need to kind of be aware of what might block our emotions, what makes us kind of avoid certain, um, certain experiences. You know, we, we all do avoid certain things you know how many times have you watched the tv and a, a, an advert comes on appealing showing somebody in distress appealing for money and um you know how often do we turn away from that or change the channel because it's really hard to, to sort of tolerate but, but so being able to to mentioning kind of distress tolerance but also being able to create an environment where we can be sensitive to distress and we don't sort of dissociate from it and then have being able to have empathy um, it's easier in some cases the, than others, but um, and then 
really trying to kind of understand what's behind behavior people's perspectives our own perspectives and then this this sense of sympathy as well obviously that often has negative connotations but sympathy in this view is actually about being moved by distress um, and actually kind of doing something about it but that's that emotional being moved by it and and linked with with care for well-being as well you know we, we could be a psychopath and have empathy um, and know that by harming somebody's family members it would get to them more empathy would tell us that um, so compassion is it's really important to have the motive behind it and actually be moved by distress and have a care for well-being as well so trying to kind of reflect use this to reflect on ourselves and what or, or perhaps sometimes people we're working with as well like what what might get in the way for people and then this issue of non-judgment, um, I think I mentioned that we're very tribal as human beings. We find it much easier when people are, we find compassion towards our family members much easier, that we're much less kind of judgmental than perhaps our, our out group. Um, and if people are quite like us, it's much easier to have that connection with them and, and apply all of these things. Um, but when people are very different, perhaps people have been watching the news and, and seen people kind of supporting Donald Trump and things and maybe had some some sort of anger towards that. I know um, there's different kind of political views and, um, and perhaps starting to feel quite judgmental, but starting trying to really kind of it doesn't mean that we don't have preferences and we don't have beliefs or anything, but understanding what, what sometimes what might be getting in the way of our non-judgment and an ability to turn towards the suffering of, of other people or ourselves so those are the attributes and then um, the skills specific skills so we've we've looked at imagery um, and we focused last time on sort of developing safe place imagery that that sense of safety in our own minds um, and we've, we've thought quite a lot about attention as well practicing mindfulness and learning to direct our attention at will um, or but also understanding that yeah it gets we get distracted that's what human brains do so having that non-judgmental um when when we bring it back so learning to focus on particular things um, and these are the ones we've briefly talked about but perhaps not focused as much on so feeling um research has shown more and more that generating feelings of um, kind of warmth and connectedness and um, kindness towards either ourselves or others and really focusing on generating that feeling can be massively helpful to our well-being but keeping in mind that sometimes the feeling might come second sometimes we um, you know the hardest thing is to have a level of compassion for, for somebody that isn't like us and that's perhaps being quite harmful towards us so we might not always have a feeling of of warmth and kindness and things inside us but we've still got this care for well-being so compassion overall is a motivation but knowing that with compassion training that feeling um can be something to work on and, and can be a really useful element and and is helpful to well-being and then sensory things so we focus a lot we've, we've done a lot of soothing rhythm breathing and knowing that our soothing system can lay the foundation for being able to practice these skills um, but but the sensory aspect as well of we know that using kind of grounding skills using all of our senses to help calm us can be um, really helpful so maybe noticing is, is there particular things that are calming to you and, and reflecting on that and, and what what kind of senses have you been using in in being able to create that and then focusing on on compassionate behavior as well choosing to to do things that are helpful sometimes we might need to act and the the, the feelings and, and warmth of compassion can kind of come after but um maybe planning in particular things in your day maybe doing one kind act to to yourself or to others in the day and, and purposely um, creating compassionate behavior in order to build on that and then finally um reasoning so we we kind of brushed over this really but um but reasoning can be and the reason I've, I've not paid that much attention to it is that I know um 
that the predominant model in healthcare that a lot of people have a, um, an understanding of, maybe not everyone on this course, but I suspect people are quite familiar with with cognitive behaviour therapy model, challenging thoughts and, and we're often very reasoning led human beings anyway. Um, so I didn't want to kind of teach, teach your granny to suck eggs. Um, but at the same time, there is something specific about compassionate reasoning, about kind of validation and things, this specific kind of element to it and bringing in all of these other skills. Um, so we're gonna um, have a little look in a minute at um, just some examples of compassionate reasoning just to, to kind of touch on that and make sure people are clear on it but then all of these th things are have an element of warmth that should go throughout it in order to be able to make that emotional connection with it um, and so but the best thing is that CFT has almost summarized all of this into just three things to remember after we've gone through all of that and that is that we have this wisdom um, this knowledge about we all just find ourselves here, the kind of that we're all struggling and trying our best with these tricky brains, that we have strength in order to, to tolerate distress and turn towards suffering and that we've got a commitment to actually do something about it. So having those three when we do our um, meditations that focusing on those three things can make it easier for us rather than having to go through kind of certainly all of the attributes and, and things in the middle. So hopefully, I feel like I've talked for a while there, but hopefully that's given a good overview of, of all of the, the kind of main model of compassionate mind training. I think I'm handing over to you now, Lee. Am I? Do you want to come back on the camera so I stop sharing? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Esther. Um, so yes, now we're going to um, look at... Um, but uh, developing our compassionate self. We're going to do an exercise. Uh, we did. Um, we did wonder whether. And uh, uh, are we going to ask if anybody wants to request any exercises, Esther? Um, we, we've got we've got the session planned. But if there were uh, any, if there were any specific exercises that anybody needed to go over, we we could do that uh, instead. But I don't think we'll have time to do all of these things. Yeah, I don't know whether if anybody wants if there's anybody with any strong feeling or strong thoughts uh, about anything they might like to do. No. We'll go ahead then. Uh, so here we're going to do an exercise on developing our compassionate self. And we start off as, as we always do with soothing rhythm breathing. So uh, if we do that, and then I'll talk you through what we're going to do, if that's okay. So if you can settle yourself in your chair, feet on the ground, feel the chair that your body's in, imagine your facial expression, slight smile perhaps, the idea that you're suspended from the top of your head, and just allow your attention to settle on your breathing. You can help slow your breathing by saying to yourself as you breathe out, mind slowing down. Body slowing down. So now settle into that. Be aware of your mind, tricky brain flying off, thoughts coming into your mind. That's okay. When you notice that, just Notice it and then gently bring your attention back to your breathing. And then I'm going to ask you to imagine your compassionate self right there in front of you. And that compassionate self will embody certain qualities. 
but it could be based on you, based on someone else. And as with all these exercises, not looking to force anything, just stay there with your breathing and try and do your best. So we've spoken a bit about the qualities this compassion itself has. First one is wisdom. Understanding we have tricky brains. Mind gets caught in loops, become overcome with strong emotion, difficult to control. We didn't choose a lot of things in our lives. A lot of it's not our fault. But we can be responsible, helpful and skillful. So along with the wisdom, this compassion itself has strength, strength and authority comes from the wisdom and understanding of the human condition. We're all in this together. And a commitment to do something about this. Courage to turn towards the difficult things, pain, suffering, understanding that we can tolerate discomfort, fears about change. So imagine your compassionate self has this strength and authority, has that inner confidence. about your commitment, Think about your desire to alleviate and prevent suffering in yourself and others. Just feel your body breathing. And then moving towards the image of what you look like. All of you. What's your appearance like? Sort of clothes you wearing? Does this compassionate self look the same as you? Does it look any different? You're strong. So how might you stand if you're strong? What will your facial expression be? How about your voice tone? If you have some sort of image, might not be a clear image, might be blurred, might be a bit bitty, might be strong, clear. Imagine it there right in front of you. Strong, wise, committed. Imagine slowly moving towards this compassionate self. As you get nearer to it, pay attention to what it looks like, its posture, facial expression. As you get closer and closer, imagine merging with it, 
stepping into its shoes. Look out of its eyes. Look out of its eyes with the motivation to be kind, caring, compassionate in the world. Notice how you feel. Spend a little while just being in that body of your ideal compassionate self. You can walk about a bit, you can sit down. Notice. Notice how you feel. Then you can allow that image to fade and you can become aware of your body breathing. Become aware of the sensation of the air as it moves in and out of your body. Feel your body in your chair. And then you can take a nice deep breath And you can breathe out and open your eyes. How was that, guys? Anybody got any comments about that? I found it hard to imagine an image, but then I did manage to do that. And then I really appreciated stepping into it and kind of feeling it in my own body and things. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. I find it hard to bring a very clear image to mind. It's mm. very, it tends to be very fuzzy. Oh, Julia, Julia enjoyed it. Julie enjoyed it. Yeah. Thank you, Julie. Mm -hmm. So Anybody my, in? sorry, sorry. Don. No. no, I was just going to say it. Anybody else yet? Hang on. <laughs> Craig, yeah. A useful stop guard to make sure we're not getting too frazzled with people. Yes, I think that's brilliant. Mm. Joy found Good. it powerful. Good. Yeah, so all these things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All good. These are, well, you know, I'll. Our, our, our intention here is to give you a, a sense of, of this, you know, to, to pique your interest and to, so you can carry on learning about this. And all these practices are things we take small steps and we need to practice them to get better at them, just like if we were learning to play the piano or something. We'd have to practice. Oh, good. Thanks, Julie. Good. Glad you enjoyed it. So my okay. challenge now um, to people is to try and keep this sense of a compassionate self as we move on to the next thing. So I just want to, as I said before, just really briefly um, talk to you about um, compassionate reasoning and just give you some examples. Um, so hopefully the, these will then help you as we move on to the next bit. So I'm going to share my screen. Okay. So these are some examples of compassionate reasoning, but really focusing on actually validating um, and understanding our distress. So it's not about just saying it will be OK. It's, there's always an element of saying this is understandable. So um, I'll just read these out, but may, maybe imagine them saying them from your, your compassionate self that you've developed in the last exercise. So it's understandable that I feel like this at the moment. Life is hard and other people experience situations like this. My automatic better safe than sorry threat system has been activated. So I'm likely to think in a biased way. 
this is understandable and not my fault. This moment of pain or sorrow or suffering is a natural part of life, but it will pass. It's understandable. These thoughts are just events in my mind rather than reflections about me. Yeah, we don't choose our thoughts. They just come and go. And perhaps I can look at the bigger picture. Is there anything I'm missing or minimising because my mind's only focusing on the negative experiences? So just keeping those in mind as we, we move on to the next exercise, I wanted to just and perhaps you, ha you have some of your own as well that will come up in the next exercise. But we really wanted to, to focus on putting your compassionate self to work. So just want you to try and stay in this, this compassionate self. Um, but just try and bring to mind a time maybe recently where you've had a particularly difficult emotion to tolerate. Maybe it's been an, an argument with somebody, perhaps it was anger, perhaps there was some sadness there, or maybe it's feeling really anxious, and perhaps being on the receiving end of some criticism, or perhaps that criticism came from yourself. So just as, as we always do, just trying to reconnect with your, your compassionate self through that soothing rhythm breathing. So noticing your breath, taking a deep breath in and a long, slow breath out. Saying those words that will hopefully become a habit on the out breath, mind slowing down. And again, body slowing down. And feeling that sinking into your chair. And just see if you can reconnect with this sense of a compassionate self. So perhaps imagining that those qualities of wisdom you know, the, the, the knowledge that we're all in it together, that we don't choose half of these things that happen in our lives and that make up who we are. And just think about where you feel that in your body. And then this sense of strength. And think about where, where you feel that in your body, perhaps adjusting your body, temp body posture. Remembering your facial expressions. And then most importantly, just remembering the commitment that you have to, to be able to alleviate and turn towards your distress. And then just really try and imagine this from your compassionate self, this difficult emotion that you've had to deal with. And what was so difficult about it? And what was so hard about the situation? Perhaps you might remember the kind of thoughts that went through your mind. And how it felt in your body. Just imagine now from your compassionate self, just sending some messages of support to yourself. Really, maybe you think about some of these statements that we went through on the last slide. What could you say to yourself? What's your voice tone like as you say it? And focus on giving this message of, of validation that perhaps we don't choose our emotions, we don't choose our thoughts. This is bound to be difficult for us as a human being. 
And if it helps, maybe picturing yourself as, as you that's struggling to deal with the emotion and send that message looking out of the eyes of your compassionate self. Sending messages of warmth, feeling of warmth with it. Not messages of support, we can tolerate this. I'm really thinking about how that lands on you, how it feels to be supported by your compassionate self. And then when you're ready, just letting that image go, bringing your attention back to your breath. Reconnecting with the room around you as you end the exercise. Opening your eyes if you have had them shut. So I don't know if anyone wants to, to comment on how that, that was for them. It's a, a different example of, of putting your compassionate self to work, practicing these things. How did you find it, Lee? Uh, yeah. Um, I, found, I, I sometimes find it hard to separate um, the different exercises. They're subtly different in terms of compassionate self, compassionate um, other, receiving compassion. So I find the more I practice it, the more I, I can use that understanding. But the, the, it's quite hard sometimes to get the difference between the the, this as an idea as an abstract idea but by practicing it, i find I, I begin to embody it a bit more and understand it a little bit more mm -hmm. okay. i'm really conscious of of the time i'm wondering mm -hmm. if we should move on to the next exercise i think you were gonna do something around practicing compassion receiving compassion which we, we kind of touched on a little bit in that exercise as well and, and developing our compassionate other as well a perfect nurturer is that right yes it is I mean I'm aware we've got 10 minutes and mm -hmm. I, I don't want to rush this I'm just wondering what we should do maybe maybe I'll go through it quite quickly and we should end with the loving kindness to self at the end yeah. Yeah. should we do that okay. yeah we've got got some comments that people people found it emotional and yeah it was really connecting wasn't it with, with the difficult emotion it's it can be really really difficult to do particularly if we don't do it that often as well um, and also, uh, for, for me when I when I if I open myself out to a time when I receive compassion from someone else I also open myself up to my own suffering and, and what I was feeling so it can be quite emotional and difficult because I, I begin to remember those feelings that I, I was having that somebody was compassionate to me and what I was feeling at the time in order to bring that compassion out of them. And that can be quite emotional. Yes, shall we move on then? Any, anything else? Uh, I won't dwell on this um, too much. Um, um, well, as, uh, as we said we're, we're trying to get a lot in and we don't want to sort of get try and get too much in and, um, and confuse people or or just um, just try and force too much into the hour so um, we'll, I'll talk a little bit about we've spoken about the different flows of compassion um, and, we, and as, as Esther said we focus most on developing compassion to ourselves from ourselves because of that relationship is most important um, Receiving compassion from other people, um, really important. Receiving it from a compassion other. So maybe we'll, I'll just quickly look at that. Um, we've spoken about the, 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 the fact that the wisdom is a, a, a part of this. So maybe if we just, if we just um, go into our, our posture and our soothing rhythm breathing, 
and just relax a little bit. Remind ourselves of our bodies and our breathing. Remind ourselves of the the idea of, of wisdom. So think of the qualities of compassion that we would value in someone else, that person that was that was giving us compassion. They understand the nature of suffering, but they understand we have a tricky brain. They know that what happens inside us is, isn't our fault. They're strong and courageous, quietly confident. They can tolerate your distress and difficulties and they will be there for you. No matter what, doesn't matter what, they'll be there for you. They have a very deep and caring commitment for you and are there to help and support you. They don't criticize, they want to, what they want to do is help build compassion for everybody. They want you to take responsibility and find ways of being that are helpful and supportive to you. So this compassionate other, what might they look like? They, can, they don't have to be human. They could be an animal. They could be a tree, a cloud, a mountain. Just allow any image to come to you of this compassionate other. Somebody that embodies all these things, strength and wisdom, commitment. How did they become so compassionate? And they offer their strength, their wisdom, their understanding and their support. They offer that to you. For you. What do you feel knowing how committed they are to being there for you? So imagine this compassionate other there in front of you now. And they say to you, may you be well. May you be happy. find the strength and courage to tolerate your difficulties in life. Imagine them looking at you with kindness, wishing you well. They feel connected to you. Just bask in that feeling. Feel the breath moving in and out of your body. Sensation of the air moving in and out of your body. Take a nice deep breath in. And open your eyes as you breathe out. So I don't know how that was for you. I felt the need to sort of hurry through that in a way. Um, I hope it wasn't too rushed. That just to show you that the slight differences between compassionate self, a lot of compassionate other, compassionate friend could be somebody that's always there for you. It's like you've got your best friend, you've got somebody there watching your back emotionally, psychologically there all the time for you. Um, any comments about that? Anybody felt it was a bit rushed, but I didn't want I, I to go. I liked it, Lee, and I, I yeah. found it helpful you saying that it could be an object or something. Yeah. And I looked at it, I took on unusually this idea of a tree, and, and it really worked for me. It was, um, yeah. yeah, even in the short period that we did, um, had this image of a big, wise tree that was so much, they, they're on the earth so much longer than us. and. Um, yeah, I found it really kind of grounding. So thank you. For yeah, and some people, you, you, you can have a compassionate gang. You know, you can have three mm -hmm. or four people, you know. I oh, didn't it? Good, good, Julie, thank you. 
I felt I was trying to get through it a little bit. I hope it didn't feel rushed. Good, thank you. Yeah, so you can have like a compassionate committee, a gang of compassionate friends who you can call on. Uh, and that helps that secure attachment, that secure base, that safe haven. Yeah. Oh, old tree too. Excellent. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> we could have a forest of yeah. wise trees helping us. Yeah. Yeah, it was easier to manage a compassionate other for me. Or oh, yeah. yeah, so you've really yeah. struck a chord with us, Sally. I've, I've never yeah. done that before. So yeah. um, Good. So Good. So we, we hope we've piqued your interest. Mm -hmm. That's the idea, to get you reading more and looking online, going to the Compassionate Mind Foundation. It's loads of uh, videos there, loads of Paul Gilbert videos on YouTube. OK. Well, I think this is um, that's a lovely message from, from Christine there. I oh. guess it, this is sort of the, obviously, the last one. Thank you so much. Um, to everybody for for kind of being with us at this time I, I mean I've certainly really enjoyed it um and and got a lot out of it and even just being able to have this nice space at the end of the day to to do some of the exercises myself has, has been great and it's it's been a joy to sort of share some of the CFT principles with people yeah I echo that so sh should we um should we kind of leave as we normally do and just practice some some loving kindness meditation and and finish on yeah. that we've got a couple of of minutes left yeah do a short one shall we to finish so thank, yeah thank you very much for your your comments yes thank you very much Bye. i've enjoyed <laughs> it immensely and thank you all so much okay so one last last time here um, getting into this comfortable upright posture. I think that you pretty much know how to do soothing rhythm breathing right now. Um, so just trying to connect with your breath a little bit. Closing your eyes if you're comfortable. Just having on the out breath those words, mind slowing down. And body slowing down and then just on your out breath saying the words in your mind and focusing on the, the feeling too may I be well may I be free from suffering May I be able to tolerate the distress that life chooses for me. And then maybe imagining perhaps the people that are in close proximity to us, if you're at home or at work, your neighbours, just imagining them there in their homes or in their workplace too. And just imagine sending out to them the same kind of feelings. So perhaps saying on your out breath, may you be well. May you be free from suffering. May you be able to tolerate the things that life throws at you. And then maybe just imagining the other people that have been through these CFT, these compassionate mind training sessions with us. And perhaps the people that are watching on YouTube too afterwards. I'm just trying to keep all of those people in mind. And just wishing them well. So may you be well. May you be free from suffering. Mm -hmm. 
may you be able to tolerate the things that life throws at you. And as we end the exercise and end these sessions, just trying to take this forward into the rest of your day, this sense of connection with other people, wishing yourself, your neighbours and the other people that are involved in this process well. So slowly ending the exercise in your own time, opening your eyes, bringing your attention back. So thanks very much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> May you be well. Yes. <laughs> Bye.